Tonight, the body of the acclaimed actor and a father of three, Philip Seymour Hoffman, remains inside this West we're Village. Falling apartment. out of New York, a tragic end for remarkably actor, uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman, uh, found dead in his West Village it's apartment. Like acting is not uh, something that is put on a canvas that you can just put up on a wall and people can come by and see whenever they want to see it. It's really what you do in that day with what you're acting. It's what you do on that day is when I'm satisfied. I'm as good as what I'm showing you right now. The loss of Philip Seymour Hoffman seems like it really never happened because what we didn't know was kept in secret, allowing it to happen in a matter of seconds. And with the sense of love and tragedy mixed together, it seems obvious that Philip is a person that we're never going to get enough of, and what we have just isn't enough. He still inspires many, capturing attention from laughter to dragging you into an emotional story with his passion and fear he brings. But in Phil's real life, there's darkness that slowly crept in on him. It's hard to put out a fire that keeps finding gasoline. The moment no one saw coming and still doesn't seem to be real. The unexpected death of Philip Seymour Hoffman. In 2014, Philip was still on top of the world of acting. He's held as one of the greatest actors at that point, with many different projects under his belt, still working in movies, plays. He's captured drama, love, and even small moments of comedy that still stand out today as characters as though it seems they stole the whole movie. He's not one to care about glamour. The light that he walks by is by doing what he loves, capturing stories, moments, and film, and taking roles and plays that many people just really don't even know about, but keeping him busy. He walks around New York City dressed as an everyday person, attending meetings, drinking coffee, just being one that smells the smells and hears the sounds of New York City as it brings the everyday revenants of life all around you 24-7. It's his home. A big part of Philip's life was intermingled with drug use that he had suffered from in the past, a relationship that he didn't want but would come up once again. He talks of his drug use early on even before the world knew him, Philip had already been in rehab, dealing with addiction, saying he would take anything he could get his hands on. Alcohol, prescription pills, heroin. But he became clean in 1989, coming out of rehab, staying sober for over 20 years, and in that time, building a family, building a career, and focusing strictly on sobriety. But in the last moments of his life, He'll let his guard down. In 2012, Philip talks about the confirmation that he's come to peace with, but that disturbs him of his problem with addiction. Trying to understand it and figure it out. It's uncertainty, controlling urges. Philip's main path with art and film are staying on a serious subject of acting. Just in 2012, Philip stays busy as usual having one of his last big roles come out that grabs the attention of people once again. A movie called The Master, stacked with a huge heavy cast, and once again showing why Philip is at the top of the food chain when it comes to actors. He's also working down the road from his home in New York City on Death of a Salesman, a play that he's put time and energy in, and with much success coming from it. When the show's over at night, Philip simply walks out dressed in street clothes, and walks off into the city, maybe going home or a place he shouldn't be. What we didn't know and see in these moments is that this are the exact moments that Philip is falling apart inside. It's believed now that he was in a midlife crisis, losing grip on control of his own mind. Philip starts to back off with attending AA meetings, attending movie sets, without his family by his side and finding the time to be with his family like he used to. O'Donnell, his partner for more than a decade, recalls that she could see that he was off. She knew that he was busy with his career. The roles just kept getting bigger 
with bigger paydays, they didn't stop coming in. She says that Philip was serious about his sobriety, even telling her at one point that if she were to start drinking, he would leave her. That's how serious he took it. But something had changed. He loses friendships with his AA relationships, and also an element that would devastate him. His longtime therapist would die of cancer, completely disrupting Philip's mind. What O'Donnell thinks at the time is just a simple midlife crisis, and it possibly was. She says that Philip starts to tell her things. He's having trouble with being famous now. Not that he was ever one to care about fame, but that he's also finding the passion for acting, just not to be there. His schedule is hectic, and he's just out of sorts. She says that in 2012, Philip tells her that he wants to, and he thinks that he should and he can start drinking again. Not much, but just a little, with dinner, casual parties. She knew at the time it was a huge red flag for what was coming, and her answer would be no. It was a terrible idea, she told him. Despite what O'Donnell said, Philip started drinking, and quickly, it progressed. By the summer of 2012, after his Broadway show, Death of a Salesman, it takes a turn for the worse. He starts to use prescription drugs, and then falling back into the grips of heroin. From that point, Philip's life becomes extremely difficult. He's middle-aged, overweight, and now has built up a nasty drug addiction that is an hour-by-hour -hour element in his daily life. O'Donnell confronted Philip, telling him that she knows he's using heroin again, yelling at him that he's going to die. That's what happens with heroin addicts. Every day I was filled with worry. Every night, when he went out walking, I wondered, will I see him again, O'Donnell said. In the last year, last months, of Philip's life. He was busy from the previous year. In 2013, he filmed two movies back to back. The first was a small budget film called God's Pocket. Shooting it took just one month. And the last one is set up to be a huge box office movie with an enormous budget that was set to make a splash in theaters when it was released. A most wanted man and also actively filming his continuation in The Hunger Games. But his addiction becomes so bad that Philip moves out of his home that he lived in with his family, trying not to have his addiction around his children. Many think that in this moment, O'Donnell and Philip split apart, but she says they don't. O'Donnell does what she can for Philip, but she's also raising three kids of herself and working full time. He starts to lose control. His skin is gray. He never looks put together. He starts to become nervous in interviews. O'Donnell, she knows that she's losing Philip. The Christmas of 2013, his last, Philip tells a close friend in confidence that he's in a bad place and over the holidays, he went on a strong binge with heroin. He's scared and seeming that he knows the end is near. He's even spotted at a hotel airport, drinking. He's even being photographed falling asleep on a public plane. In the last year of his life, he's tried rehab once again to no luck, finding lasting sobriety. Philip has found himself in the kiss of death from heroin. In the last 30 days of Philip's life, he's busy with new projects and meetings. But just the last two weeks of his life, Philip is at the Sundance Film Festival in Park City, Utah doing his part to promote his two new films being released that year, God's Pocket and A Most Wanted Man. This is the last time the public sees him. He gives many interviews and seems calm, taking time to take photos, one photo shoot in particular, where something odd would happen. A picture would later emerge of Philip. The photo captures him, what looks to be the true inner look of how he feels where he's at in his mind. It's a grisly look capturing his last public appearance. On February 1st, 2014, the last full day of Philip's life, it's a normal day. He gets out of bed, puts his clothes on, and walks to his local coffee shop that he goes into every morning when he's home. He orders a four-shot espresso over ice with a splash of milk, his go-to. He makes slight talk with the staff, hello, thank you, 
Good morning. They say that everything seems normal with him. He's polite, cheerful, from what they can tell. He's by himself. He takes his coffee and leaves. Next time he's heard from, it's at 1.30 p.m. when he speaks to his assistant on the phone. His assistant says everything seems normal from what they can tell, business as usual. After the phone call, it's now 2 p.m. O'Donnell says that she sees Philip outside of his home and saying that she thought he seemed loaded, not acting himself. Then at 5 p.m., Philip is walking down a street when he is recognized by one of his neighbors. He says hello to Philip, who was bundled up in a heavy coat with a hat on. The neighbor says that Philip slightly raises his hand up, giving a brief wave, but still walking, seeming out of it, and not really wanting to talk. Later that night, he'll meet two acquaintances for dinner and more or less business talk. He's at a local restaurant that he often attends. He eats a cheeseburger with a few drinks. It's a short dinner, not lasting long. At 8 p.m., O'Donnell talks to Philip the last time, checking in on him and reminding him of what they had planned for tomorrow, that he's supposed to pick up his children. She says that she can tell Philip's high, missing words, slurring, not answering questions, but there's not much she can do. They hang the phone up with each other, and that's it, the last contact with Philip. He then walks to a local ATM. With multiple transactions, he takes out $1,200. It's believed to be the money that he'll spend on drugs that night and then heads back to his home. Sometime in the night, Philip takes heroin and cooks it, sucks it up into a needle and injects it into his veins, right into his arm, doing this multiple times, also taking prescription drugs. Philip is doing what is called stacking, taking multiple drugs or the same drug and stacking it on top of each other in his system. But at one point, Philip goes too far and in the middle of shooting himself up, his heart stops and Philip falls to the floor, ODing, and still with the needle in his arm. At 46, Philip Seymour Hoffman is gone. As Philip was scheduled to pick up his children that morning at 9 a.m., it comes and goes with no answer from Philip. O'Donnell, in her worry, calling frantically. She calls a mutual friend, asking them to go check on Philip. The friend arrives at 11 a.m. at Philip's home, letting himself in, calling for Philip, but finding him in the bathroom, on the floor, needle in his arm, with a trickle of blood running down it. Philip, black and blue, it's obvious he's been dead through the night. The police are called, and the world would know by February 2nd, 2014, of what happened to Philip. Everyone's watching as Philip's home is swarmed by people and police. Less than two years from Philip getting back on drugs and spending the majority of his life clean, this is now the outcome of what has happened. His funeral is held days later with friends and family. O'Donnell stands at the church door looking outward as her children hold her weeping. Much like Philip's life in New York City, living it out in the open, his funeral, a good part of it, is held out in the open as well for people to see. And then that's it. Life moves on, his children grow up, and his films are still with us today as they live on. It's hard to look at the sickness that Philip went through and that took his life. Addiction is an element that seems unfair for many people that suffer from it. The life and legacy of Philip Seymour Hoffman will stay around for many decades to come. He's still loved and missed by many. The love, charisma, and inspiration of Philip.